So the first speaker is Patricia Gober, which is present here, and we will try to present her transparencies without transparencies. <laughs> okay, she's from the um, Arizona State University, and your talk is about, uh, uh, okay, scenario planning for uncertain urban water futures. Thank you. So I'm going to take seriously our challenge here today, which is to talk about the lessons from the past to address the challenges of the future. And I'm using the city of Phoenix, the desert city of Phoenix with about four and a half million people in central Arizona as my case study. And I'm going to share with you some, um, maybe, I'm going to share with you the, the, the process of scenario development, how we've used scenarios to take the past and apply it to the future, and what we've learned about that. Uh, so uh, I, w I also wanted to uh, tell you that uh, I think unlike the, um, my other panelists here, I'm a social scientist. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a geographer, but I'm mostly inter uh, interested in, in, in social science. And I'm interested in building resilience in the urban water sector. Uh, but for me, resilience is, is about being able to construct better, more useful, future-oriented models. But it's also about building social processes around this, the, these models. So I've spent the last 10 years of my life working with urban water managers and bringing urban water managers in Greater Phoenix together with um, the scientists, the climatologists, the hydrologists, and the other scientists in our team to see if we can learn how to um, use science, to develop science that's more likely to be used for uh, urban water decision. How are we doing, guys? We're, we're, we don't have any. I'm okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I have a different perspective on, uh, a slightly different perspective on modeling and this emphasis on um, the social, uh, social scientists can look at the social processes. Who's involved? How do people make decisions? What do they care about? What are policies that they want to talk? about what are policies that they don't want to talk about. Um, uh, how do scientists see uncertainty differently than decision making, which influences then the way science is used for decision making? All of these have been questions that we've um, asked uh, systematically in our, uh, in our social science uh, uh, exercise. We've, uh, we were funded by the National Science Foundation in the, oh, uh, some 10 years ago in a social science initiative to change the climate science question from how do we reduce the uncertainty about, uh, uh, about climate to how do we learn as a society to make better decisions in the face of inevitable uncertainty about the climate? So we employ decision-making under uncertainty strategies, one major strategy of which is to use scenario development. So we're, we spend a lot of time getting in, uh, asking our stakeholders to ask questions, what if? What if we were to engage in this particular policy? What would be the consequences in terms of um, uh, securing Phoenix's long-term water supply? What are the effects of different kinds of policies on, um, on uh, uh, water resources sustainability? Um, is, it, is it possible, as is projected in Phoenix, to have eight million people living in the middle of the desert um, uh, in business as usual kind of conditions. So we get, we're asking these what if questions about the future and getting people to engage in, in those kinds of questions. We would, um, uh, we, we, we always saw ourselves as um, something of a, we call it in uh, social science, a boundary organization. Uh, people who sit, I've got great pictures of this, but people who or scientists are sitting with decision makers at the boundary of science and policy and trying to unite those two, um, uh, those two fields of study. In fact, we've spent uh, 10 years trying to learn how to do that and, about, and um, 
five years ago, I moved to Canada and um, tried to implement my decision making under uncertainty strategies in, in, in Canada. We would assert that it's a, um, it's a new way of thinking about uh, how do we engage in resource management, how do we achieve sustainability, no longer looking for the one best perfect answer, but rather to have a public discussion about what, our, what, what sacrifices are we willing to make in order to achieve um, a, per, a given end. So we actually talk about this as being a, a, a new paradigm for water resources management, um, to move away from optimization and prediction in favor of scenario development and asking what if kind of questions. What if we uh, banked more water? What if we could conserve 10% uh, more than we're using now? Uh, what if we were to engage in uh, growth management so that we have a smaller population or at least a steady population going further? How much resilience would that buy us in terms of the urban water system? So we ask different kinds of questions. I have a great picture of our water model um, that, that I could show you. We have a water that shows the supply and the demand for water in Greater Phoenix. We get water from um, upstream watersheds from the Colorado River, as well as from, um, as well as from groundwater. Uh, and we're really talking about, about a system largely of, uh, of, of urban water demand. Uh, we, we have a... a oh! <laughs> <laughs> Show that? Yeah. It's good news. Is it? Yeah. Here's our model. Uh, uh, and uh, we're, we're interested in, in, in people putting different inputs and then looking at how changing uh, growth rates, changing conservation behaviors, changing water banking policies would influence the uh, long-term sustainability of urban water systems. We, I really wanted you to see this slide because we've spent a great deal of time trying to visualize our model for decision support. Uh, so we, uh, we, we show our model at, we, we, That one right there. Yeah, it's a good yeah. one. Yeah, yeah I'm, good I'm one. fine. Okay. I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so we, we look at a series of, um, of policy choices down the, um, what, 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 what really are policymakers willing to do to enhance the sustainability of water supply in this desert city? Are we willing to um, take more farm water into urban purposes? Are we, we willing to recycle, um, reuse more water? What policies are we willing to engage in in terms of protecting environmental flows? How much population growth um, do, do we want to see? And um, what is the, uh, the, the use per capita? So we've designed the model really after, after um, trial and error over two or three years, our policymakers told us that they, they really weren't interested in the inputs that we, had that we had decided to put in, that they wanted policy choices that they could control. Um, so if you want the policymakers to use the model, we had to put in the policies that were relevant to our decision makers. Uh, it, it seems crazy, but it took us a couple of years to be able to, to learn that. And then we, um, uh, visualized outputs. We were lucky enough to uh, be uh, uh, co-located with uh, a decision theater, um, a room maybe a third of this size um, that's set up with screens where we can show our model in the background, where policymakers become one with the model because they're manipulating the inputs and manipulating the outputs and seeing in real time in a in an enclosed space what the impacts of their policy decisions about environmental flows or conservation might be. Uh, <clears throat> we've also uh, uh, done some research and to look at um, what could Phoenix survive uh, uh, mega, drought, mega drought conditions. The title of this, um, this, 
this session is um, uh, how do we, uh, what are the lessons learned from the past to address the, challenge, the challenges of the future? What if Phoenix were to experience another mega drought comparable to what happened in the region in the 12th, in the 12th century? So we can simulate those biophysical conditions in our model and have an experiment about what would have to happen in a policy sense in order for four and a half million people to continue to live there or arguably even more people to be able to live there if you would um, talk to the uh, growth leaders in the, in the community. Uh, just very quickly um, in, in terms of the, the, the results, uh, we, we show that um, business as usual is not sustainable. For us, a, um, a sustainable state is groundwater, a hundred year supply of groundwater. Groundwater is a bank from which Phoenix draws water in times of uh, 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 um, uh, shortage in its surface supplies. So we want to have, a, in fact, the law says we will have a hundred year supply of water for, um, to support any new development. And the answer, and the, 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 the uh, diagram before shows you that um, uh, Phoenix's water supply is not sustainable. We're losing that 100 years of drought, even under business as usual conditions. And the lower green line shows that we would especially, we would lose it even more under mega drought conditions. But we can implement a series of policies that can um, uh, balance, that can ensure a long-term water supply. And so we, we through um, public discussion, we settled on five policies that people are really interested in talking about. They're interested in talking about growth management. They're interested in talking about conservation. Conservation has enabled the, over the last 20 years, has enabled the, um, the region to grow uh, as it has in most uh, North American cities. Uh, growth management, conservation, water banking, water reuse, and augmentation. That's a fancy word in our world for talking about a desalinization plant in California that we would use to um, augment the city of Phoenix's supply. So we, 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 we play around with this with, uh, with, with stakeholders in various orders. Which policies do you want to add us, want us to add first? How much of a particular policy would you like us to, uh, to, to, uh, um, to implement? And in the first slide, in the top of the first slide, you see um, uh, growth management. The long and the short of this is that growth management in and of itself is not going to um, produce the, a sustainable 100 year supply of water. What about? Um, how about growth management in addition to conservation? You bring the, the uh, you take some of the peaks out of the water, water supply situation. The combination of the three, uh, growth management, conservation, and water banking, pretty much produces a uh, sustainable supply over the long term. There's no magic bullet answer. I'm not advocating for any particular strategy. This is just a way to enable policymakers to alter the levers to see what it's going to take and how willing, what are the trade-offs you can, um, if you're, if, if you're, you, you're gonna have to build some very expensive infrastructure to replace conservation and growth management. So these are conversations that people have in this setting. Uh, uh, so, so we're in, in, a, in a way, we're using the past mega drought condition to be able to create what if scenarios of the future to engage people in our model to think about um, a sustainable water future in Greater Phoenix. Um, I think scenario planning helps us to manage uncertainty rather than be paralyzed by it or wait until we've uh, reduced the uncertainties associated with, uh, with climate change. We use the models to simulate alternative futures. We emphasize policy and human action. We emphasize the kinds of tools that people have available to them now to be able to alter. Um, I say informed scenario development because we pretty much, we spent a, a considerable uh, period of time, year, 
couple of years, in fact, trying to figure out what people w were willing to talk about and what they weren't willing to talk about in a public space. Um, so our scenario development is, is based on <laughs> trial and error and um, uh, information that came from the social processes that we observed in the first several years of our project. So we're using modeling to reveal critical trade-offs between infrastructure conservation, conservation, and um, uh, uh, growth management. Uh, and I put in uh, uh, that it's a 13-year uh, effort. If we spent more time up looking at the model, I, I posted the model as water sim 5.0. It's really water sim 25.0 because there's a 1.2 and a 1.3 and a 1.4 and a 1.5. It's constant revision. And I say this because um, dealing with stakeholders and decision makers is a highly iterative process. And it doesn't fit the traditional academic time scales and funding procedures particularly well. It's a long-term uh, game from which we've only now begun to, um, to learn some lessons about uh, using the past as a guide to deal with the challenges of the future. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much. Just a burning question, because at the end, there will be a long panel discussion. So if you have short questions, you can do it now, no? Okay. It's your turn. Now it's uh, Vantan Van Duen from McGill University who will present his communication on linking climate change to impacts on adaptation studies in urban areas, modeling of extreme rainfall processes of a wide range of scale. Yeah. So oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. You are PC or? Mac. You are Mac. Okay. We have to do that. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Suros, for the presentation. It's very good today to have the opportunity to uh, discuss with um, you the, uh, some of the issues that we're dealing with. And first of all, I have to say I'm an engineer, so I try to do something that would hopefully be useful for engineers in practice. So the main question that we're dealing with all the time is now, to design some urban drainage structure, how we link climate change to the design procedure. And you will, I try to explain the situation in Canada where many municipalities um, under the pressure that we have to deal with the question of climate change. So the outline of my presentation is to deal with uh, what uh, the research we are doing in terms of scale. And that is the real problem because the way we talk about the scale issue, climate scientists look at that in a different way than an engineer. So the communication that is the thing that we try to preach, the um, different uh, scale issue. And today I talk about a very specific problem like design of an urban storm sewer system, just to give an example. And then we just show uh, a decision support tool that we just developed I just went around the poster session and can see some of the IDF relation talking about sub-daily uh, extreme rainfall. So I hope that we could see the uh, different issue dealing with the um, extreme rainfall modeling. So we talk about urban water management. So very quickly, we have three issues, uh, population growth, the impact of land use change, 
But now we add on the climate change impact. So over water quantity, water quality. But when we talk about impact adaptation, then the question of scale is important. And then an engineer, we have to deal with that issue, in particular for urban area, in many cases, very small. 10 square kilometers, like parking lot or some other a very small scale. So the question of spatial and time scale of the problem are quite important. So let me just show an example. When we took measurement of rainfall and we decide on the, the time interval that we took measurement, one minute measurement or 15 or the common time is one hour. So you see the rain gauge or the instrument that you use, you decide on the, the time for the measurement, and you get a picture. So the same storm, depending on the time of measurement, that we can have two different images. And then if we build statistical model based on, let's say, 15 minute rainfall and one hour rainfall, you get two different models. And there's something wrong there because we need to know how to develop uh, the scale invariance model because cannot depend on the time that we selected to measure rainfall. I just give an example of 15 seconds sampling of the real storm and one hour is a very common time step used for measurement of precipitation. And you can see that completely two different picture for the same storm. So we believe so much in what we measure is not the, uh, the very good way because we have to think of what are the property of rainfall that independent of the scale of measurement. That is time scale problem, and we could have the same thing for the spatial scale problem. It is the real issue in practice because, you know, engineer, if you use two different topographical maps with different scale, then the same watershed have two different area for the same river, so something wrong. But you know, the area size is very important to the, determine the, the flood peak. So there's some problem in terms of the scale in space. So we got some publication to deal with the similarity between flood from one particular watershed, and we identify some scale invariance property of flood in terms of the similarity between different area signs. So the scale problem is important because that, you see everyone like to have some high resolution, but at the same time you get more noise and the instrument will be more costly. So the question that's very important is, what is the optimum uh, instrument or time scale that we need to do? Which resolution we need? And also now we're talking about different like 100,000 grid points, how to analyze a lot of information available. So, and finally the modeling. So the question of scale is so important that has some theoretical and practical implication because the way we design, how to observe, how to measure, and the way we develop model, very important on the, in particular on the scale of measurement or observation that we consider. So we rely on that. When I look at the climate change issue at that time, and you can see that based on the global, regional, ecosystem scale, hydrological scale, so we get all together, and luckily we get funding for that center at McGill. So we study the climate change. And I started to learn with my colleague in the climate scientist the issue of climate change. Now, I'm going back to a very specific problem of extreme rainfall for design. We don't know what would happen, but in the last few years, if you can see in Canada, there's a number of floods, and that caused a lot of damages in the city. So because of that, now we get more funding to do research, to look at the, and some, the government thinking that because of climate change, but we don't understand that. But at least you can see that cause problem. So my colleague Environment Canada just give me this picture, this is the old statistic, just to show that natural disaster, in particular storm and flood increasing. We don't know why, but that is the issue. Now, temperature also changing in Canada based on the observation, again, from my colleague in environment in Canada, 
provide a picture to see. In some area, we get cooler. Some area will be warmer. Now, so because of low flood, so we got funding, lucky again, five years to study the flood in Canada. So this is, uh, uh, we heard another session, uh, flood net by my colleague, uh, Kuli Bale. So um, in this project, we have 12 universities dealing with the flood issue in Canada. And I'm leading only a sub-project. I'm co-leading team one, but in particular, one sub-project dealing with the intensity, duration, frequency curve, the extreme rainfall. So I'm talking about that now. So you know why we need the IDF, intensity, duration, frequency curve, if you look at that carefully, from the time series of rainfall, you have to extract the extreme rainfall, and then you do frequency analysis in order to know how frequent that extreme rainfall could occur. So we talk about IDF, and engineering practice use that. It's very important. Every city, we have that relationship. So based on the IDF, we can get the design storm and we design our structure. So now the main problem when we get this project, like the government wants to know, what is the impact of climate change on the IDF relation? Because that would affect the way we design or manage our structure. So let's take an example. This is one of the um, IDF in Montreal City. And we had that big flood events, that big storm at that time. 1987 is uh, for sure that more than 100 years, we got McGill University, we have the record for more than 100 years. And you can see that flood that killed one person at that time. So based on the IDF, at least we know that flood will be quite extreme comparing to what happened in the last 100 years. So the project, the objective of the project, you can see that how to deal with climate change impact on that relationship. And also we try to develop some update of the regional rainfall map for Canada. So I just put some key challenges. We need to link climate change. And then we had a non stationarity process because um, in the future, the process could be changing. And then I had to deal with ungay site, very common, and also the regionalization issue. So those are the key challenges when we look at this uh, problem in the past four years. So this is year number four. I have one more year to finish that. Anyway, so I'm currently co-chair this group for the Canadian Standard Association. We have the second edition of this guideline, and now we have to include climate change into this guideline. So that is what currently we are doing. And in the next four or five months, we have to come up. So I have a lot of issue right now, how to, con like, to be the bridge between the climate scientist and the engineer in this working group. So hopefully we will find um, some uh, compromise in the way that could help the engineer to deal with the climate change issue. So, so I'm look back at the traditional way of how to develop the design rainfall or the IDF. And you can see that there's no way uh, in, the, in the original traditional approach that you, we did not look at the time scale issue. So five minute rainfall, 10 minute rainfall, we do that independently. But actually we could have that in the same storm. So the time scaling issue that important. So when I look at the traditional way, then we have the time scale problem. There's no consideration between five minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes, up to one day. And the spatial, because we do that at one point, and there's no climate change consideration in the traditional approach. So that is the three main issue we're dealing with. Again, I involved with WMO to revise the guideline just to look at the way we do frequency analysis for single size, also for ungauge size. So these are the current practices in many countries. Okay? So how to link climate change? So I use this to show the climate scientists provide global climate model at 
this resolution, and then we have regional climate model, try to get more detailed information. But for impact model, we may need this one for urban flood, one meter, even for one point. So for the design, I put the question this way, how to link the global climate simulation to one point, in particular extreme, and that one particular site. So we have different approaches, one based on dynamic and the other one based on statistical downscaling. So in the center at McGill at that time, I'm leading this group to compete with my colleague mainly in atmospheric or climatology dealing with dynamic downscaling. Anyway, this is the book, our urban rainfall group in Europe. We get together and look at the climate change issue impact on urban storm drainage. And my colleague from Belgium, Patrick, he took all the regional climate models in Europe at that time and tried to see each model gave a different climate change factor. So this is a real problem, like the previous speaker talking about the uncertainty of climate change. And you can see none of the models is good. So for engineers, that's a real problem because we don't know how to deal with the uncertainty of these different models. And if you look at the projection, you can see that also that if you project 100 years, different models give a very big difference. So this is what we're facing. So now I just go quickly. So go to the statistical downscaling. Even we know TCM bias cannot capture the local precipitation, but we need to link, if possible, because that's what we need, sub-daily extreme. And the main challenge is the daily extreme, uh, linked to sub-daily. So that is the, the challenge. And we developed some procedure that could be able to link from GCM down to five minute maximum. So that's what most of them has been published. So I could provide that. Now, for engineering practice, so that's important. So we developed this decision support and I presented also to the city of Montreal for decision maker to know what impact of climate change on extreme rainfall. So this software, we can do uh, data analysis, statistical basic one. We can select the best distribution, and then that can develop in a few minutes the idea for the current climate. At the same time, we can do the impact of climate change on the idea based on different like downscaling model for different model. So I just gave an example for an application of 84 stations in Ontario that pack up our study in this project. And you can see that in the software we have around 10 different probability distribution that have been used for extreme rainfall around the world. So in most cases the engineering practice just to fit the model, and they are so happy with that when you get a good fit, but it's not what we are looking for. We try to see the predictive ability because we try to project that in 100 years because when you get a good fit doesn't mean the model is good. So we have to do some bootstrapping to create some uncertainty. And you can see that in the software, you can have predictive, you can look at the way how the uncertainty for different model that you identify the best one based on the uncertainty of the selected model. So it's not just descriptive, but you have to look at predictive. And this is 84 station with the colorful like this. You can pick up for a given duration, given location, what is the best model based on a number of different criteria. So that is what we're doing. So for this example, uh, we have uh, identified three models, and then we select the GEV ba based on the conservative. Yeah, so you make that easy. Anyway, I go quickly. So in that software, and here's the most recent result based on the CMIP-5 21 model. 
you know, IPCC use that, but if you look at that, they cannot capture the extreme rainfall at the observed. So the ensemble of 21 model is the blue one, cannot capture that. Uh, but we need to do correction of bias. If you do that, then you can capture that for the current climate, and then you make projection in the future. In any case, so in this software, we develop a technique. So I can just fit the model for 24 hours, and then we derive all the distribution up to five minutes. It's not independently, but considering the time scale. And also just to show the 21 model from CIMI-5 using scenario 4.5, gives you different answer for different model. In any case, uh, this is what we achieved so far in after four years of project, I'm dealing with XI regional multi-site. So the conclusion is, I didn't touch anything. Anyway, the conclusion is there. I believe that um, there are so many. Yeah. Anyway, the conclusion is there. So I think that it's feasible for us to link the climate information down to what we need for the design of urban uh, storm trainers. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we'll switch to Stefan Algat from the World Bank, uh, managing uh, risk and uh, natural risk in cities from geophysical information to decision making, something like that. Yeah, so Thank you very much for attending this, uh, this session. I'll start with just a few words about uh, where I come from. So I'm working with the, the World Bank. So as you know, we're, the World Bank is making loans to governments to uh, invest in development and a lot in uh, urban infrastructure. And within the World Bank, I'm in a, within a group called the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery. And this group is uh, financing uh, risk assessments that is supposed to help people doing development projects take risks and climate change into account. So what we're trying to do is not to do disaster risk reduction because more or less we realized every time we're doing a project to reduce risks, the time for the project to be completed, you have like three new neighborhoods being built and five highways and you have reduced the risk by 1% here and it has increased by 20% there. So instead of trying to do disaster risk reduction, what we're trying to do is to make sure new investments take risk into account and that we do development that reduce, that increase risk if it needs, but as uh, little as possible. So um, in, in that group, uh, we have had a lot of action at the, at the city level, uh, just because this is where a lot of investments are taking place. And also because this is where investments we're doing have the longer term implications. So for a lot of the projects we're doing, um, for a lot of the projects that we're doing in agriculture, for instance, the, the lifetime of whatever we're building is like 5, 10, 15 years. In cities, once you have developed a new neighborhood, well, the neighborhood is there. So that there is a lot of irreversibility in the decisions we're making. So this is maybe the sector where it's the most important to take into account not only current risks, but also future risks. Um, so. Just to, I thought that as, as an introduction, um, I would take the example of, of Mumbai 2005 because it's, it's one of the first time um, I was working in a project with direct interactions with uh, policymakers. It was in 2007. And uh, so we, Mumbai had just been affected by this massive flood uh, in 2005 and we had been working, uh, doing this kind of work, very, very fancy work combining climate, model with downscaling, with hydrological modeling, with 
loss assessment with an economic model and we had like all of the all of the things and and we arrived to talk to people in Mumbai and they, they were just like so it's very nice of you but our problem is we have tons of garbage in the drainage and uh, we know what we need to do right we need to manage this so that the drainage works we don't need fancy things we have very simple problems in a sense and I mean I was very disappointed because they were really cool maps um, <laughs> but um, the, the, the lesson and that maybe why I've moved to more like policy oriented work where that if we don't start with a real question, a real issue, something very concrete and very narrow, it's very difficult to provide an advice that really changes something. And um, my experience is really that when we, when we even at the, at the facility I'm working on and with now, when we're doing something on managing flood risk in the city, we do interesting work, but it's very rare that we have an impact. When we start with a very concrete project, like somebody wants to build a new railway, it's very narrow and they have very precise questions. This is really when we, we, our work uh, gets traction and, and have an impact. So it's basically moving from this idea of a traditional way of making decisions where you first create the knowledge and you run the analysis and so on and then you look at what you have and you make an optimal decision, which in other terms is doing the science stuff and then make a decision to something that's really different where, where things are much more integrated, starting with something a decision maker wants to do, can be a dike, can be a road, can be a social protection system, and looking at the vulnerability of what they want to do. And then when you're looking at this vulnerability, you can work with policymakers about how to reduce those vulnerabilities. But you, you really don't start with the problem. You start with, with the solution that you're trying to, uh, to improve. So I'll, this is very abstract, right? So I'll give you an example in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Um, so quick question before I get into trouble. Somebody from Sri Lanka in the room? Nobody? So I'm, I, I'm safe. I can say whatever I want. Uh, no, so if, if you happen to... Uh, to uh, know the region or to have worked in the regions, very happy to, uh, to get your, your feedback and reactions. Uh, this is something that's going on at the moment, so it's uh, interesting to get, to get feedback on that. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about this project because this is one of the good examples where uh, we managed to, uh, to have an impact in the decision-making process based on a scientific assessment. So we have a project going on in Colombo, Sri Lanka. This is the, the uh, Colombo Urban Development Project. This is a combination of many infrastructure, water, electricity, drainage, urban transit. And as you do a project like that in Colombo, you really need to take into account the floods uh, because this is a place that has been affected uh, regularly by very big floods. What you see on the bottom left is the parliament. So it's a, it's a nice place to work because you don't have to convince parliament members that flood is an issue. They all got their offices in the water in 2010. So this is something, I mean, at least all of this awareness work has been done for you by, uh, by a big storm. So the question was, how do we change the way we're doing this very broad project and land use planning in the city to take into account flood risks? And one of the characteristics of Colombo is the presence of very large urban wetlands within the city. So they, 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 this is a, one of the cities that kept the wetlands up to now. Uh, and these wetlands are providing a range of services. Um, some are flood related, but many others are like landscapes, ecosystem services. Those wetlands contribute to uh, cleaning the, the water. Uh, so a lot of, of services uh, associated to that. But still, when you have nice land in the middle of your city, uh, it attracts interest, right? So when, when this project started, uh, people had a debate in Colombo about what to do with those wetlands with very concrete proposals to dry the wetlands, to drain them, and to build hotels and uh, kind of like high-end uh, housing in those areas. And, well, I mean, this is very well-located land, close to services, close to jobs, and so on, so it's, it's something that, that can be considered. And at the same time, other people were uh, trying to call for the preservation of those wetlands 
based on all of the arguments I gave you before, like floods, but also many, many other things. And one question was, um, what does the, the preservation of the wetland do to floods? And how do we bring climate change into this equation? Does it, the, the, does it change the way we should think about that? Um, so traditional way of approaching this problem is you take a climate model and you look at the flood risks and, and you try to, uh, to optimize. And of course the problem you'll have is that you take all of the models and in November when you have the most rain in Colombo, models tell you that like, the change will be between minus 30% and plus 60%. So basically if you just want to support a decision, you just pick the model you like and you will get exactly what you want. You want to develop the wetlands, you pick the model at the bottom. It will tell you that these wetlands are not very useful and you can build hotels. If you want to keep the wetlands, you pick the model at the top. Not very satisfying. So the solution was to just a little bit changing the, uh, the problem, looking at different policies to keep the wetlands and looking at which of these policy, uh, how do they behave in different future, trying to identify how things can go wrong. So really the starting point was, imagine you're in 2030, um, do you have people yelling at you because you have decided to build these hotels? Uh, do you feel like regret that thinking like you should have done it differently? Uh, but focusing on the, the vulnerability of different strategies. So we, we built on the, the availability of a, a model that was uh, financed by, uh, by uh, the facility I'm working with and, and the World Bank. So we had, we had this model to start with, but instead of trying to pick one model that would work well, uh, we tried to cover the full uncertainty. And this is just to give you a very quick sense of all of the uncertainties we tried to plug into that model. So uncertainty on the hazard, how much rain do you get? Uh, and this is linked to changes in climate, so different climate models, but also change in land use, um, how much um, roads you will be building and so on. Uncertainty in the exposure, how many people do you have in Colombo in 2030, 2040? How rich are they? Are they living in small houses or big buildings? Um, assets quality. What, what type of houses do people have? Do they have houses that can manage floods or not? Uh, do they have early warning system that can help them save what they have in their houses? And also, how can people react when there is a flood? Uh, can we rebuild very quickly? Uh, do people have, are covered by social protections? Um, and, and finally, what are the coping capacity of the city? So all of that is very uncertain. So when we, when we talk about climate change, we tend to focus on the uncertainty on the climate conditions, but here we really try to bring all of the uncertainties, which is kind of scary because we don't know anything about all of that. And when you plug everything in your model, you, the range of outcomes you get is of course extremely large. So what we did is to create this uh, dozens and dozens of scenarios trying to cover the space of possible future in four, I mean five different scenarios. Uh, one in which you remove all of the wetlands, build these fancy hotels. And at the other extreme, you don't touch anything. You try to protect all of the wetlands that are in the, in the city now. And so you have that on the X axis. And on the Y axis is um, basically you're in 2030 and you look at how happy you, ha you are with the decisions you have made to select one of those strategies. So in the right hand side, for instance, you have this huge range of outcomes. Some points are scenarios in which you have uh, kept the wetlands and you're pretty happy you did it. And if you're below zero, you protected the wetlands and you're kind of pissed off about it because uh, after the fact, you felt that it would have been better to use some of that. And as you move on the left, you protect less and less and you have the, uh, the, the value of the wetland that you have protected which, which, uh, which evolves with, uh, with your choice. And what we did is to basically identify what are the conditions under which in 2030 I have people yelling at me because I made the wrong decision. And you can identify in which conditions that happens and that's things that are partly due to climate change. So you're more likely to regret having built your, um, your wetlands if precipitations increase a lot, but also things like 
whether houses can cope with floods very well, uh, what about what's going on upstream of the river, which is not under control of the, of the city officials, and things like if you build the hotels and you make a lot of money out of it, who benefits of this money? Is the money living because it's a, it's a Hilton and a, a hotel and all of the money is going to Hilton shareholders, or is the money staying in the city because it employs a lot of people with decent uh, wages? So really combining the science, the, the, the climate stuff, with a lot of the social economic uncertainty we have. Um, and the point we tried to make to the, to the policy makers on, on this and this work, all of the simulations were done by a local authority in, in Colombo uh, with, with our support, but they were running the model. The, the regret is minimized if you keep something around 90% of the wetlands. And if you keep 0% of the wetland, uh, maybe you won't feel any regret. Maybe it's the right thing, but the potential for regret is very, very, very high. So this is something that people can come after you in 2030 because it was really a very bad idea. And basically what happens in those scenarios is whatever you do in terms of dikes and drainage and stuff, you can't control floods in uh, Colombo. There is no infrastructure solution, so you have a city that's flooded again, again, and again. What's interesting with those results is that it was part of a process without like experts doing the work in Washington DC and sending results to Colombo. But as I said, with uh, an, uh, an authority in Colombo running the model, a lot of back and forth, a lot of workshops to discuss what are the reasonable scenarios for the city, what kind of floods are acceptable, what kind of floods are not acceptable. And what's really interesting is that when the study concluded all of these results and the minister in charge of urban development was convinced that something had to be done to protect those wetlands, they had elections and the government changed. And it's just like if you had done like nothing, except that just before uh, leaving, they created uh, a wetland management unit within the Ministry of Urban Development. Basically something with three, four people, very, very tiny, but with an institutional memory of the work that has been done. And this little group, even though it's, it's, it's very tiny, were basically continuing to push these results with the new government and what we got. So this is 2015, and that is last summer. Uh, when uh, Sri Lanka announced the full protection of all of the wetlands in Colombo. So this is my Hollywood movie part of the presentation where everything ends well at the end. Um, after like f three years with the new governments trying to understand how to use these results and so on, uh, and this little group inside the government trying to uh, discuss and promote the results of this study, in the end this summer they decided to create uh, a new law to protect the wetlands uh, in the city based on this idea that if these wetlands are developed, we cannot go back and the potential for regret is very high. At the same time, if we keep the wetlands and we realize in 10 or 15 years that it's okay to develop them, it will still be possible to do it. So it's really a, a precautionary principle type of approach of saying like the, the stakes are just too high to do it now with the knowledge we have. And I think this worked um, only because we had the entry point at the beginning, that we had a very precise question, do we develop those wetlands or not? All of the work that we did before on how to manage flood risks in Colombo did not lead to anything concrete because it was just too broad and too vague and we never got the decision-making uh, perspective on it. So I'll stop here, but for me this is really when we need more of the scientific community engaged uh, because this work took a lot of time from people who know how to run the models, how to interpret them, and so on. And there are not so many people that are doing that job in, in developing countries. We have plenty in developed countries, but not so much, so many in developing countries. So this is a call if you're interested in this type of work. We're ready to help make the right uh, connections. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so Philippe Gouverville from uh, Nice University will present his talk about uh, risk and resilience, challenges and opportunities for cities. Thank you, Th thank you, Daniel, for, for the introduction and for participating to this uh, interesting session. So I, I would like to share with you a few ideas and few uh, references and few experiments we did during the last years regarding resilience. Uh, the session is dedicated to, to cities and some of the challenges, so I, I don't resist with the pleasure to share with you a few slides about the uh, existing situation of some cities around the world. So uh, you, it's, it's a situation which is not in Europe, even if I'm coming from Europe, but this is a situation of urban development in Mexico City. So you see how intense the development of the city could be. Uh, this one is a city which is a little bit more complex, but which is Kowloon in Hong Kong, so is, which is one of the highest density for buildings in, uh, in the world. And this one, it's a well-known situation in California. Uh, those three situations are, I would say, cities where we are facing quite interesting challenges uh, regarding, uh, of course, water supply, regarding uh, natural hazards, and uh, obviously that will be one of the challenges we will face in the coming um, 15 years. This is a map which is showing the, uh, the size of the city for 2030, and you will see the millionaire cities around the world, and you will see this extremely high density of millionaire cities in Asia and uh, mainly Southeast Asia and, and East Asia. So over there, we will have many challenges, including those which are related to climate change. In Europe, we have produced this very interesting map, which is showing some of the problems we are supposed to face in all European countries. You see that all European countries will have to face climate change issues, going from sea level rise, but also uh, higher uh, rainfall events as it was introduced for, for Canada. We may have to face this type of things and also draw and so on. All of those are, I would say, important challenges that we are supposed to, to face and, and to cope with. Uh, what you have on the screen is some of the events we, we have faced during the last uh, few years, uh, from 2011 to 2015. So on the right side, you have the situation in Nice. So Nice is not only the sunny Riviera, uh, French Riviera, you know, but we may be affected by flash floods or events that could came very, very quickly and affecting deeply, uh, deeply the city. And on the the left side of the slide, you see uh, an interesting storm we, uh, we had on the, uh, over the west part of France with a very serious flooding with many victims. In those two cases, we had more than 10 people who died during the, those events due to the, mainly the lack of information how to behave during such a type of events, uh, and obviously not with the sufficient protection solutions that were implemented. Um, the noise is quite strong, but the two events were, were quite famous. So you have two examples, so which is about the very well-known tsunami we had in 2011. And on 2012, the, um, uh, the Sandy Storm, which was affecting the city of New York, you, you see that in both cases, it was strongly affecting the uh, urban environment and, and the population. So something which is... Quite interesting is basically what, what we have over there. So the vulnerability of cities around years has increased. Um, we faced uh, a lot of failure regarding the protection, the physical protections that have been designed, which were supposed to avoid such a type of problems. We, we had difficulty. You have a very interesting situation on, on the right side on, on the picture, which was been taken in, in Bangkok in 2011. You see the nice highways which have been created over the actual streets that were supposed to avoid congestion with the traffic. And obviously, most of the people of the city trying to save their cars. So the best solution was was to park the cars on the elevated highways and, of course, to block all rescue teams. So this is a kind of thing which, which is coming very, very frequently. And maybe the nice example was this example that was made in, in Japan. This wall was, according to the best knowledge of the expert in Japan, built to avoid a 10,000 return period event. We had more than two meters of water above the wall which was created over there. So obviously, we have to anticipate, we have to integrate those elements and try to build a better and to have uh, an alternative concept that could help to have a better preparation with, with, with our cities. So there is something which is now extremely trendy. Everyone is talking about resilience. If you go on, on Google, you will find it was a few days ago 
57 million references. So I'm pretty sure we are now 59 million references, and it will be more even at the end of the week, for sure. Uh, but the idea is, is how can we prepare our cities to be ready to face a serious situation, and how can we try to restore the functioning of our city, and in a way try to improve a little bit the situation afterwards. Uh, you will find most of time this curve in, in the literature. We have this disruptive event that could be flooding, that could be earthquake and so on, affecting the city. And then we are losing some of our services and we try to recover. We, we relieve, we respond, we recover, we, we restore. This is a theoretical curve that everyone agreed to have. Uh, Resilience could be to try to minimize the impact. So in fact, we try to prepare our cities to be challenged by, by different type of issues and trying to, to restore faster and to prepare. And somehow what you have in blue is the era of the resilience that we may try to introduce in, in our cities. Obviously, we may have three situations. So from the event itself, we may have a very catastrophic situation where we fully collapse, so that may happen, and it was already the case in, in history. We may try to restore, to come back to a steady state. We will try to also to improve or to deteriorate, so that could be the three stage we may face after a, a major event. There is a very uh, nice example that we can take from, uh, from uh, the city of London. Uh, we had a big fire in uh, 1666, three days of fire, uh, mainly more than 13,000 houses were, were burned in, in three days. It was said that the fire was initiated by the French guy. It was not. It was an English guy, so I just want to underline that. And it was affecting more than 70,000 over the 90,000 inhabitants of the city. It was a real disaster. Most of the wood houses were, were destroyed. But after that, we had a new London, which was made mainly with, uh, I would say, stones. We had a new organization of the city and with a new urban design with a better quality regarding the living condition, regarding health condition, and it was, in fact, the last bubonic plague we had the last the year before. So it means the catastrophic event helped to generate a better urban environment for, for the citizens. So in somehow, you cannot improve if you do not have the crisis itself. So it means if now we come back to our nice curve, uh, in fact, if we try to improve the resilience of the city, you will see that we are facing a series of disruptive events, small ones, we try to minimize, but in fact the story, the evolution of the city will be a continuous chronology of those disruptive events we try to, to improve. Obviously for the developing countries this is quite challenging, for the developing cities this is more challenging than the developed cities, but this is how, how it works. Now about the new cities, so once again this is the uh, Kowloon environment in, uh, in, in Hong Kong with the density of the things. We may have two different approaches, so one of the, uh, the solutions is to try to give emphasis on structural measures. So this is one of the examples, which is also very trendy in Europe, so this one is, is in Nashville in, uh, in the US, so the idea is to have this wall, this protection wall that could be placed in case of flooding in order to protect the, uh, uh, the center of the city. This is quite costly. Uh, it may be efficient, but it's not always sure that it will, it will be not uh, overtopped by something which is big. So the principle is the following. We define a return period. This is how it was made for the IDF curve for, for the situation in Canada. And from that, we assume that we are providing protection. So most of the time, this is 100 years. This is potentially the idea that in our lifetime, we will see it only once. This is the basic motivation. So why 100 years? Why not 75? Why is not 120? This is something that we can really ask and, and question. Of course, we can improve the situation by introducing non-structural measures. So this is the resilience. We try to increase awareness of citizens. We make them more aware. We are preparing the city and so on. And we try to reduce impact on economy, on activity of the city. And so we are moving to this new curve. So it means we will try to reduce consequences. Obviously, if we are successful to do that, uh, the question of the level protection will came. Uh, why do we have to continue to protect with 100 years return period? Why not moving back to 75 and investing more in the resilience measures? Because this is something that we have seen, for example, in the example I mentioned about the city of Nice. In 2015, we had 21 people who died. They were 
dying mainly because they were not behaving properly regarding the flooding. Most of them were trying to rescue their car in the underground parking lot. With 20 centimeters of water, they were just washed away by the wave, and 21 people were dying in the parking lot. So you can do whatever you want regarding protection sinks and so on. If you don't provide the relevant information to the people how to behave during those things, you cannot improve really the situation. So why do we have to continue to invest in walls, in protection sinks, if we do not invest in information to the, uh, to the population. This is clearly one of the things. Now, if we want to move back, to, mo to move forward and try to help the decision-making process, um, we, we could try to give a practical approach for, for the resilience. Uh, so the idea was to try to quantify the resilience and to provide indexes that may analyze the situation within cities at the parcel scale and up to the city scale in order to support the decision-making process. If you would like to analyze what is a city, you will basically to have to identify functions the functions are combined, associated to buildings, and all of those buildings are operated, are linked with services. You have only nine functions and five services, and with those, with those functions and services, you can fully describe how a city is. Now, when you have an event which is affecting the situation, the behavior of the city, you may give a very simple mark. You can give a, a level, assess a level. Zero means nothing is available. Five means the situation the services are still fully operated. So it means you are not impacting the general behavior of the things. So if you succeed to establish that, so if you have a collaboration which is made with the different citizens, the decision makers, you may have arrived, you may reach a consensus where you have a description on the different services, the different functions, and you may analyze how you identify priorities. What is the most important for you? Is it residential? Uh, do you have to stay safe during the flooding? Or do you have, for example, still have the economical activity running on and, and, and so on? So you may define priorities according to, to your things. Just to give you an example how it works and how it could be implemented. So here you have the city of Nice. So this is the, uh, the, center, the center of the city. We may identify all the, all the buildings. This is what you see in, uh, in, in gray. Now we may identify the function of all of those buildings. So you see you have education, you have governance, you have health, and, and so on. So for each of those buildings, you can give uh, a, an idea. Here you have the flooding map. So this is a 50 years return period flooding map. So if you have that, combined with the function of the building, you can easily uh, create one resilience index, which is showing how far activity within those buildings is affected by the flooding itself. If you are red, you are strongly affected. More green, blue you are, and less you are affected, and more you can continue to have your, your activity. Here you can zoom in, so you see the water level over there, and obviously those which are yellow are the most impacted, so it means you will have problem on water supply, on electricity, and so on. So you may analyze in a very detailed way how the things could be organized to support the population, and you can identify priorities. So this is a tool that could help for making consensus. You may operate at the uh, house level, of course. You may have individual activity, but this is not the most important. The most important is to try to operate at the block scale, because most of the time services like water supply, waste collection, electricity, transport are provided at the block scale, and this is what you have to do. So once again, you have the same map over there which is produced at the block scale, where you can see clearly what could be the priorities. It's a lot. Everything which is red is supposed to be a priority. So this is something that you have to discuss and to uh, investigate afterwards with, uh, with, of course, decision makers and the consensus of the population. So it's just to say this is something that we can move on. Here you have a small video, which is not on, on this. It's just to say that this idea of um, indexes regarding the resilience is becoming popular. Here it's just showing uh, it's a web service which is allowing you to upload your, your data, to upload your file, which are GIS based, obviously, and then you can move on. You can introduce some parameters uh, regarding the different services, regarding the different functions. Uh, you can modulate the weights you give to the different variables. And obviously, at the end, you arrive to something which is allowing you, here you can see the different dependencies between the different indexes, the different variables. And at the end, uh, you will have a mapping which is applied in this small catchment, which is an urban catchment in Genova, the city in Italy, which has been strongly heated by flash floods quite recently with about 12 
12 victims who died during, during the last two years. So here you see clearly what are the buildings, what are the areas where you sh should engage uh, quick action in order to reduce the impact of, of the flooding. Uh, basically, and to move on regarding resilience, how to improve, for sure, uh, one of the key aspects is to try to move in non-structural measures. So with two, two strategies, one is to understand processes and try to increase awareness. So to understand better, it's clear that we have to review some of the concepts on what we are doing in, in, in engineering. Something which is quite important in engineering, we are always using the same concept for designing the different services. And most of the time, we have a centralized view. We like to have one place where we are doing everything and bringing up the services afterwards to everyone. For a very simple reason, we have this view due to historical situations that we had in Europe. Most of the cities were about five to six kilometers wide, which is just one hour walk. So it means all the design we have made up to now are basically five to six kilometers. So if you look at the wastewater treatment, electricity supply, water supply, this is what we are seeing and this is what we have exported in many things. For the water supply, this centralized approach remains the main aspect. So you have the example over there for, for London. And what we should do is to move from this centralized approach to the decentralized to, if possible, to something which is just, uh, I would say, a distributed approach where we have a combined elements in order to provide the services. This is the case for, for those cities, Los Angeles and, and Tokyo, where obviously we need things. In order to do that, we need to have additional tools that could help to provide data and models that could provide elements. So here you have a view on Nice, which is a 3D view of the city of Nice. This is not aerial pictures. This is a really 3D landscape where you can walk in and you can look at the different buildings. And obviously, you can use this virtual environment to simulate and to restore and to show what could be the impact. So it contributes to raise awareness of the population. So we can move very far in that. We may generate high resolution things that could run almost in real time. We can, be, we can have very simple tools. This is something that we are doing right now with virtual reality. So you can walk in the street, 1D scale, and you can, you can zoom in. This is real data. So you will see in a few seconds inside of the, uh, of the city itself. And you can see also the flooding. So it means everyone can understand, can feel what could be the water. Is it just 10 centimeters or is it half a meter and so on? You can see the situation of your, of your house and you can see how, how you are in, in this one. So just to make quickly, yes, so you can walk in the street. So this is real picture of the environment. And obviously you can also generate the flooding. You will see the flooding coming, uh, coming to you and, uh, and having the view. Yes, so the water is coming. So it's just the idea of having those elements that could support the, uh, the, the process. Of course, we can address larger scales. This is another application which is in Corsica in France where we are touching uh, not only urban environment. And this one is something which is even bigger regarding the size, so which is about, uh, I would say, 65,000 square kilometers in, uh, in, in Vietnam. Just to, uh, to conclude and to, uh, and to reflect what has been the session, we have now to face a diversity of risk in most of the, of the cities. Resilience is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Ah, so I'm also attacked by, by the timer, but I'm just finishing on this one. So the resilience is the opportunity to discuss uh, within the cities on, on the strategy. And obviously, this is a possibility to have a more integrating capacity for, for engineering. And uh, obviously, it requests to have a more accurate definition of what is uh, really resilience and to be recognized by practitioners. I will stop with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next talk will be given by Hervé Le Treut from uh, Sorbonne University. And it's about the interface between interdisciplinary climate sciences and decision ma ma making at the territorial level, lesson from a case study in southwestern uh, France. Is it a Mac? Is it a Mac? Is it a Okay, 
Ist das genau klein? Je prends le, le, pas le, le PPT, c'est mieux. OK, so, uh, thank you. I, I'll try to speak about something which, uh, in, 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 uh, in a way, is a, is a bit modest approach. I'll try to, to explain the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the combination of uh, issues that, that brought me there. I, I originally, I'm... Uh, and still, I, I'm the uh, uh, global climatologist. I've been working uh, mostly on global climate model, physical model. And maybe one of the things that uh, attracted our attention in the last years is twofold. F first, we, we have a difficult, uh, difficulty to, to have the people uh, understanding really our science and taking it, it into account. We've been developing uh, climate services, we've been developing a lot of uh, uh, results from our global model that should be used to build cities, to, to build, uh, and we see that uh, there is little of it which is in fact really being used. Uh, and the second thing is uh, we, uh, we, we, we are in a, in a situation where uh, we, we have a a climate which is changing, definitely, uh, and uh, the, we should uh, take into account the, the, the future, and we'll see, I, guess, I will give some example, that uh, we, we are now facing limits where many things uh, that we should do are no longer possible, uh, which we should have done, are no longer possible. The last IPC report said that uh, we, we can uh, stay beyond the 1.5 degree limit, but in fact we know that this is a, a possibility which is in fact implying uh, things which are not possible. So th th there is a, a, con a context which makes that uh, we have this, this feeling that science is not really uh, used. And uh, I, I was at, at the time, uh, at the same time, approached by people of my hometown in Bordeaux to, to do something locally about climate change. And I got uh, in this, uh, well, let's say that we're for, for uh, uh, affective reasons first, but uh, little by little, I, I was extremely interested by, by the way we can try to approach the, the problems in a different way, not relying only on, on models, but trying to make sense out of uh, a number of things. So, and that has uh, in many things to do what, uh, with what, uh, um, Oh, don't know. <laughs> Stefan, <laughs> just stayed before. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to look at uh, one region, uh, which is uh, in fact a nice and important region in France. So you have a map of uh, a, a picture of Bordeaux, actually, I think that was at the time when we hold the, uh, a, a session of uh, GSC with uh, Soros. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we, I will try to deal with uh, three, three main issues, adaptation issues. What should we do to have some real adaptation at the level of the cities and at the level of the larger uh, landscape around the cities? Second thing but, uh, will, will be to, to have uh, some, some link with the people and to, uh, to, to look, uh, look at how we build some uh, kind of dialogue with the people. And, and then I'll uh, have some... Uh, conclusion at the end on what we should do as a new science for that. Now this is just a map of uh, this uh, re uh, region. You see that uh, it's, it's a large one, main city is Bordeaux, but you have a, all the network of small cities. And of course, between the, the, the large city, the largest city, but Bordeaux is about one million uh, people, and, and so uh, at, at the interface between these large cities and smaller cities, you have all where the resources come from, all the agriculture, all the. Uh, so it's also part of the same uh, of the same structure. So, where? Okay. 
So one, one of the things uh, I'd like to emphasize is that th this adaptation of territories to global changes is something which is necessary. I don't know what it's. Oh, it's okay. It, it, uh, it's something which is necessary, I think, first as a protection. I think this has not, uh, maybe the word protection has not been used, but I think really when we speak about future climate, and uh, I think uh, in, in, in France there have been many uh, misunderstandings about uh, what we should do in the future, and uh, we've seen some events around it, but protection is, is a key thing. We, we need to have, uh, and protection is against risks, not against facts, and even uh, predicted facts is something, but this has been already said. So it has to be based on future climate evolution. And um, I think what we need is something which is a, a science at the closest in interface with decision making. I think when we began to work, at, it was at the, uh, it was, uh, at the origin, the, uh, the, the, the local uh, government, the government of this uh, region of southwest of France, of Aquitaine, and uh, we, we, we had difficulty to have a common language and a common interface. Decisions were never based on scientific issues, almost never, and we, we had to understand why. So what we did was to try to, to build uh, some kind of uh, uh, scientific uh, committee for, for the regions. So it was initially supported by the local government, but we decided not to be paid, to be fully independent. So the project was really held on little money. Uh, and we, we, we first uh, based that on a careful assessment of existing science. And we were extremely surprised to see that if we wanted to, to look at this uh, border area and this southwest area, the amount of information which was not used was huge. <laughs> uh, we, we managed very quickly to have uh, 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 something which was a local IPCC report, and this local IPCC report was based on uh, local scientists, and uh, we, we had 400 uh, of them uh, working directly on climate issues in different, uh, from social sciences to, to, to different kind of uh, agricultural, or, or a huge amount of scientists, and uh, we published two books, and uh, these uh, two books were very different. I will speak mostly about, about the second. The first one was in 2013, as you see. The second one was in 2018. And the uh, first book was uh, finished, all chapters. We, we managed to try, well, we managed to develop chapters that were uh, transverse. Uh, way of, and I'll give some example afterwards. And, uh, those transverse chapters were all finishing in the same way. Well, it's a nice, important thing, for, for example, uh, the uh, agricultural future, but, uh, well, it's complex. We should do more science. <laughs> and all, si all chapters were finishing like that. Second book, we tried to, uh, because it was published as book and, and sold uh, to, to large audience in the region, uh, we managed to, to have some uh, not conclusions in terms of what we would like people to, to see, but what we would like people to, to uh, think about, and of course decisions have to be taken by elected people. But uh, th this um, led us to uh, a conclusion that we, we had to, to go a bit further. So we, we decided to, to do a, some kind of tour of this region, went to 20 cities and visited uh, those cities uh, with our uh, reports and had a, a, a wide range of outreach activities, and we targeted uh, for those visits, uh, and it's uh, still going on, uh, one, or, one or two still uh, to be done. Uh, the, the elected representatives, companies, the cities, and high schools, university students, we had a big, uh, a big back, uh, uh, backing from uh, local papers. And what was, I think, the first thing that really uh, uh, impressed me, that in fact, this information about, uh, which was basically the information about what the region would like, would look like uh, 30 years from now, that's uh, in all fields, what would we try to do? Well, had never been accessed in a systematic way. I mean, it's like, it had uh, no interest for anyone that uh, tried to have a, a, a real 
be scientific, uh, scientifically based uh, image of what happens locally uh, using uh, the, the huge mountains of results at uh, global climate models, but also the, lo the, local, uh, the local evidence is not something which is uh, really down. Uh, as if we, we didn't rely very much on science to, to take decisions, and we're not even very much interested in doing so. That's something uh, that uh, took our attention, and that's why we went afterwards to, to, to go uh, in, in, many, in many small cities. So just this is the name of the people that were the, the main, uh, uh, constituted the main group. You can just see quickly that, but no, no, you have to be French, that they belong to different, really different kind of scientific worlds. Now, just let's go to, uh, uh, of course, there is uh, always uh, something when we speak about territories, in France people are territories, but, well, people, uh, know that the territories have no complete capacity to, to uh, they are, do not hold their future in hands. Uh, if we look at, in France we, at the amount of greenhouse gases that are uh, emitted by France, it's 1% uh, of the greenhouse gases, maybe 1.5. It means that everything we have over, uh, over our heads comes from elsewhere. So this, which is a kind of uh, uh, increase in temperature that we've seen over New Aquitaine is something we cannot do anything about. Uh, it's also probably the case for precipitation, although it's more difficult to diagnose because uh, if we look precisely at uh, what causes precipitation, we have different climate regimes, and those climate regimes, they determine in fact different kind of climate impacts, and uh, will, will the, the system is, is behaving uh, as a um, something that hesitates between different futures by itself, so it's a bit more complex. But anyway, we, we, we have no real possibility to interfere with this uh, hesitation of, uh, of the climate system. Now, we may have a, a, a necessity to, to know a bit more because we, we, we see things which occur which are really some importance at, at the long range. For example, agricultural droughts, even if we cannot predict everything, they are more uh, real, and this is a, a region which is ext extremely dependent on agriculture, and cities depend on the resources of uh, their interlands uh, also in, in a strong manner. So the questions, for example, that we, we, we should be able to, to answer if we have done the studies, we, we, are, are, are all those uh, 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 agricultural droughts similar? Do they uh, uh, have consequences which are different one from the other? What is uh, the, the, the impact on fauna, on, uh, on, on, on animals, on all that has been studied? All that has been studied. That's why we were able to gather the information of uh, hundreds of scientists, but it has never been studied systematically. And uh, so, just to, to get a bit more in this, uh, these are the main issues we tried to look at. Well, we looked at uh, global climate, going from global to local, that's what I said, but uh, more generally, we also went to past, uh, from past to present and future. But the, the role of memory is, uh, is extremely important. All the, the, the way the, the landscape was built makes uh, uh, a tribute to people that were really thinking and, uh, uh, and what might happen in the future, and that was uh, years ago. So we, we, we tried to look at resources, health, vulnerability, key vulnerable areas like mountains, shorelines. And I'll finish at the end with governance and, and, and the role of uh, democracy in all the, the, the process. Now, just a few examples. I begin with this one. If we look at uh, the, the regional context, and we, we try to look at how Bordeaux and the other Aquitaine cities interact, uh, for example, uh, we can use the water cycle and probably the, also the, the entrance of air quality. These are things which we do not uh, dominate, but uh, they, they really act in some uh, systemic way. Uh, water will be changed in the future because uh, uh, well, it's uh, the precipitation issue, which is difficult, which I mentioned, but you have also water coming from the mountains, and the melting is m earlier now, it will be more early, 
which means that uh, when you you are uh, I'm not sure you, can, uh, you are uh, you, you are in summer yeah, this is a summer uh, water the summer trends in water it, it's diminishing as it's diminished it has a, an, an important uh, 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 impact on agriculture and agriculture in this country it's uh, forest corn wine I put it a bit uh, stronger it's a border area. Uh, it's had an impact on biodiversity, which we have a le little water. And agriculture is mostly uh, agriculture that presently that needs uh, uh, water in summer. So th this is really systemic. And if you look at the water, we have two big estuaries. Uh, well, one big estuary with two, two uh, rivers here in, uh, here in, uh, in, in this part of uh, also France. You see in red, these are the areas that can be uh, subject to sub submersion. Uh, you, you have a lot of uh, agricultural resources. Uh, this, uh, there is a nuclear plant here, and there is Chateau Margaux here. You may decide what is uh, most dangerous. But you have a situation which is uh, 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 dependent on water and the drainage of water here is extremely important. You have a, uh, you have a change in, in, in here in, in, in some kind of mud problem that, uh, and also all the you have a, a sand hill coast here, which is uh, uh, also where all the sand is driven here, and this is changing. The system is changing globally. You have to manage it at this scale. We have everything we need to do it, but we don't really uh, do it. Um, another example is, is for example, is, is uh, the, the, the city itself. The city itself, this is just one image. We, we, we had difficulties to find on the city of Bordeaux itself some indication of decisions which are uh, based or not based on, on, uh, uh, on evidence from, from science. This is just an image of a, a uh, and uh, a heat wave uh, in two years ago. And what you see is uh, the fact that the city is really built in a way that in the center you, you have dense part, and dense part means temperatures that in summer presently go to 35, and we know that very soon that they will go to in degrees Celsius, and they would go to much more. If you just get a little away from that, you, are, uh, you, 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 ma you manage to stay in uh, areas where uh, life may still be livable uh, in, in the future. How do you manage, uh, how did people manage in a few decades, because it was not like that a few decades away, to build a city that is not uh, resilient for heat waves, for uh, warmer climate, in a context uh, when we saw when we know in this, uh, everything, so th these are the questions, and uh, also we we had examples of cities uh, cities along the shores, cities along the shores where they, they, they developed in the, in the 70s. Uh, sand hills are a good protection, but if you are on the wrong side, on the wrong uh, uh, sand hills. Okay, so I was long on that, and we 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 we, we had. Uh, we would have difficulties then to, um, and so there are many decisions that can be taken and discussed. So let me just uh, finish by, by two, two slides. I think uh, if we really we, we want to tackle those uh, uh, challenges, first we, we need to work uh, with a close interface with society. When we bring all those problems, which we have tried to gather and discuss in a systemic way, to the, to the different uh, policy makers in the region, uh, at, uh, in all the small cities where we, we've been uh, traveling, I think they, make, uh, they, 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 they take it for uh, as an important information. We realize that. And, and so we, we need to, to try to do this science really at, at the interface, a real interface with science, and also with citizens, NGOs, actors of the territory. And so reconciling the, with uh, climate and adaptation. And then I have another conclusion, uh, a little. Um, it's uh, the fact that we probably need uh, to, to, to think that adaptation is completely mixed with the idea of uh, 
uh, uh, diminishing greenhouse gases emission. There is a strong link to the two, and there is it goes through many elements, including the mix, the regional mix uh, energy. Uh, and I just wanted to finish uh, by, by this uh, transparency. The person that uh, uh, made this chapter of energy, local energy, was uh, Michel Combarnos, and he died just a few days before uh, we re submitted the, the reports to, to, re to the region. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we are moving to, thank you, don't move too, too far. We are moving to the panel discussion. Okay, we need one chair more. Thank you very much, uh, the audience, and uh, thank you very much, our distinguished uh, invited speakers. Um, and uh, for some of you who came a little late, we did have some technical <laughs> problems that affected the entire auditoriums uh, and uh, rooms where the talks were delayed. So I apologize to the speaker, especially the first one. Pat was very gracious to start just talking about what were some of the messages. I'll try to be very brief because we are already a little behind. And uh, uh, so the, the, the whole idea of this session was to look at cities and geophysics. What have we learned from the past that could help us deal with the challenges of the future? Uh, Pat was uh, the first colleague who gave a nice talk and uh, coming from the experiences she's had as director of a major urban center um, at Arizona State University, uh, looking at the framework for the uh, scenario planning, uh, particularly how to deal with uncertainties with urban water issues, uh, both from uh, water um, quantity and quality, and also dealing with the hazards uh, of extremes. Uh, so, um, and then our, our friend uh, Van Tan Van, um, no one gave a perspective uh, from the engineering side of things as how do you deal with the extremes in terms of this s s city infrastructures and in what way and shape are the climate change scenarios, at least you're not perfect with the scenarios, but at least if you look and come up with an envelope of what the uncertainties mean in terms of the future and how the cities have to manage. Uh, particularly flood uh, issues that he uh, talked about and also the infrastructure that provides the water to the, uh, to the cities. Stefan uh, gave a very nice perspective uh, coming from an organization that funds a lot of projects and uh, project projects uh, that go to the World Bank have to have some degree of credibility in order to the bank to write the checks and give to the uh, various countries in order to tackle them. And he talked about how does particularly cities deal with managing natural risk. And uh, from a geophysical and information theory point of view, how would you integrate the information into uh, some of the planning that deals with the natural risk? Philip uh, gave a very fascinating presentation giving examples of some of the larger cities in the world and what are some of the challenges and risks with respect to the resiliency and uh, what are some of the opportunities that these uh, cities have and uh, perhaps to tackle some of these uh, difficult uh, situations that we have. And uh, I gave a nice uh, talk in terms of how interdisciplinary approach to the use of climate science can be integrated into the uh, planning, uh, particularly on a regional basis, and give example of a few cities. Well, um, as a hydrologist, I can appreciate the issues with respect to water and whether we've learned lessons and how to deal with the future. It's a different thing, and that's the biggest challenge. I lived in the city of Tucson, Arizona for 20 years, a city that relied 100% on groundwater, and uh, 
way before I got there, they had already depleted the aquifer, and um, I think they reached uh, a point where they decided this was no longer sustainable. And then part of the water that was brought from the Colorado River is now being recharged, and Pat has a better perspective of that, which is not the same water. It's got a lot of salt, and it's a very costly proposition. You hear stories about cities like Jakarta, one of the fastest sinking cities in the world now because of the groundwater depletion that is taking place. So not only from a water uh, resources point of view, but in, even from a built environment point of view and how cities are growing, given that the world population, as uh, demographers tell us, is uh, we've already passed the 50% point of people in the world of 7.4 billion living in cities, and that number is expected to reach about 60 to 65 percent in the future. So obviously challenges that are there. I hope that uh, some of the younger people that are sitting there see these to be as opportunities. As far as the American Geophysical Union is concerned, we represent a union of geophysical aspects from atmosphere to climate, and now we have geohealth that has been added, and you know health hazards with respect to mega cities are, are a big, big problem. So the question is, what are the lessons and what we've learned? I know we run out of time because we want to, wanted to have each of the panelists to reflect on each other's talks. I still give them that opportunity. Otherwise, we open it up for question. I should say at least the society that you belong to and you pay your dues, American Geophysical Union, is trying to set an example of that. So we just went through a renovation of the headquarters of AGU, and we've created perhaps the first building in the city of uh, Washington, D.C., which is a net zero energy building. If uh, you don't know the definition of it, Google it. It's very easy. It comes up. And it's essentially that the amount of energy that is consumed in the building is generated by all the resources, such as the sewer generating the heat, and, um, and uh, many other aspects. And if there's an opportunity, you may want to go to the lobby of AGU that has been open to, to get a feel for what it means. So with that, I open it up to the panelists if they have any other words of uh, advice uh, to give. Otherwise, we'll open it up for questions. I don't have advice, but I have an observation. And, and that is that um, I, I think I self-identified myself as a, as a social scientist, and I, I've been coming to these meetings now for 10 years. And I have to say, I've always been treated with respect and, and, and a, a tr tremendous amount of interest in the social processes that surround decision making, but I've never felt before today um, one of the team. Uh, and, and so I, I, I uh, I have to say that, that um, uh, I, f I feel like I'm preaching to the choirs with, <laughs> with, with these guys. That, um, it, it's, a, um, it's a real evolution from what I could see ten, 10 years ago. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you for being Any other members of the panel will wish to say? Uh, something reflecting on the other talks you heard, or we just open it up for... So please, uh, if you don't mind, go to one of the mics, unless you're a very loud person that everybody <laughs> could hear you. I'd like to have to make sure everybody hears the questions. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, thank you very much for all your talks. Um, so you all have experience working at kind of this intersection of research and policy, which uh, I think is a very intriguing kind of area. And uh, I'd be curious to more explicitly hear your thoughts on what needs to be done, especially in the context of the geophysical community here, to make the information that is kind of created by the research community more useful or uh, to have it be uh, translated more usefully or uh, what needs to structurally be done so that the research gets, the important research gets done and the important research gets put in the right places to be most useful. Who wants to take that? Uh, I, can, I, can, I can start. I'm sure my colleagues will have uh, many things to add. But the, for me, the most important thing is there is no mass market for uh, policy advice, scientific policy advice. 
it's really like art and craft. Like everything needs to be tailored, everything needs to be done like with regards to one specific decision, one specific group of policymakers. When we're working in a city in Africa, you don't get the same kind of like capacity with your counterpart than if you're like in a ministry in Morocco or North Africa. So everything is different. So I, I don't see a lot of um, uh, impact at scale. It's that, that's the challenge your community has. It's everything is small and you have to accept that because there is no way you're doing a big effort and you publish an IPCC report and then some people will just take it and uh, adapt it. That, I don't see that working that way. It really takes a lot of like hand holding to have people use those data. So the challenge is it's super time consuming and you have your job to do and nobody will ever thank you in your communities for <laughs> spending time with people like us. Um, so I understand that the challenge for the, I mean, I was an academic for like uh, 10 years, so I, I know the, I know the problem. And as long yeah. as the community doesn't itself recognize this work as something interesting, I think this will remain challenging. The, I think that this change would be very valuable because it's not a one-way street. I mean, you can inform decision makers, but I've learned so much with decision makers telling me about the real, the real problem, and you find some very interesting research questions. And I think it would also help make some of the articles published in journals with all due respect a bit more relevant <laughs> sometimes. You just look at the literature, you just don't find something that from a, a, a policy perspective is the obvious question and, and nobody seems to be looking at it. And I think there are like a lot of opportunities to pick very interesting and, and low hanging fruit in terms of research by spending more time with decision makers. But this really needs the structure to change. Individually, I know how challenging this is. Thank you, uh, Stefan. I think uh, Professor Grober has something to add to this conversation. I, I, I would add that, 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 I, that if I were giving somebody, uh, 10 years later, if I'm give, giving somebody advice, interaction with decision makers from the, the first day, um, the train leaves the station in terms of what science is done, what research questions are asked, what policy variables are, are included, and people don't feel ownership with us and our work if <laughs> they have not been consulted from the very, from the proposal stage um, about what, what it is that, that we're doing. We, we lose so much credibility by, well, we'll give a, try a little experiment and see how it works and have something to show with people. That, I, I have scars on my back to, to demonstrate that doesn't work. Um, and, and so I would pay great, and, and we have paid great attention now in, in, in Canada to be bringing stakeholders to the table, even during the awkward stages of the uh, proposal development. Thank you, Pat. Philip? Yes. Yeah, ju ju just a quick comment because, I mean, so I, I have the feeling that some of my colleagues are a little bit pessimistic regarding, uh, re regarding the future. Uh, I would say, especially for the young people, so I, I would just say that re regarding the project or the situation we are facing, it's becoming more and more complex. Mm -hmm. So it means the people we have as decision makers are less and less prepared to face those challenges. So it means they will have, we will have the opportunity to enter the game and to come just because we have, I would say, kind of duty to deal with complexity. And this is what we do in most of our activities. So there is uh, an opportunity to take and to try to bring new ideas, new views on what will be the complexity of the world. So it means we may come with new concepts. Technology is helping us to bring things and to bring new ways of, of decision making things. So. Uh, I would not have those, this very pessimistic view ab about the future. I think we, we have the possibility to open the door and, uh, and to have, a, I would say, a, a better consensus uh, process that could be, that could be implemented in, in more and more sophisticated and more inclusive projects, obviously, we will have to do. I, I don't think I was pessimistic, though. I mean, I no, it's, uh, uh, it's just like this is a little bit like swimming against the current, but, uh, but that can work. Harry. Yeah, I, I, I think this is a problem of being optimistic or pessimistic it always depends on the, on the kind of uh, question you, 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 you ask. And I think the, the question right now has always been, uh, when we are being asked by, by, by journalists, uh, 
uh, about uh, staying under 1.5 or 2 degrees or 3 degrees, things which are rather abstract. And in fact, we, we cannot answer them with certainty anyway. So uh, the result of uh, this way of thinking has been to, to, to put a, a very large emphasis, which is necessary, of course, on uh, diminishing greenhouse gases. We need to do that, uh, and greenhouse gases emissions. But doing very little about uh, local uh, um, adaptation, which is also necessary because we know there are risks. Those risks will increase, and which is necessary also because I think the, the, the matrix of uh, what will be done in the future will be done mostly at the, uh, in many cases at a very local uh, uh, scale because that's, uh, that's where things are, are being done. That's where you have the, the people working, where we have the factories, where they have the, you, you have to, to work at this scale. And well, you may see in the future whether this is bringing also uh, a way to, to diminish greenhouse gases. But I think you should not put that aside. And I'm surprised to see when people speak about the, the green funds, for example, to see that they are s uh, uh, supposed to help the, 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 the poorer past, uh, the poorer part of the countries. And the largest part is in how they can emit less greenhouse effects. They don't emit lots. But uh, they should also have a, 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 an important uh, aspect on how they can adapt to what will happen to them. And th this is very often forget forgotten. And I think we, we, we have many reasons not to be, I don't know, pessimistic or, pessim or optimistic, but to, we have many actions to do in any case, many actions. OK, uh, yes, please. Hi, this is a question for Pat, but anybody on the panel can answer this. Um, I was impressed by something you said at the very end, that this has been a 13-year effort on your part working with stakeholders. And that means, I presume, that you must have had incremental successes along the way, or they would lose faith with you, basically. Um, and if you, if you couple the need to have that long engagement with stakeholders, if you couple that need with the fact that it seems that stakeholders, particularly in developing countries nowadays, are saturated with people coming to them wanting to help. So how I'm seeking advice, but I'm doing this in Vietnam, is how to, to engage the, the right people in the stakeholders who are, are not just the, sort of the, the lackeys who are there to have a jolly day off or something like that, but who are going to go back to their line managers and, and have some serious discussion. Uh, what, what you said is uh, very true. We call that uh, uh, one of our big challenges was stakeholder fatigue. <laughs> um, a, a, and the, the, there were a, a couple of ways around it, um, or at least we, we offered an awful lot of free lunches. Um, and, and I mean, it, it's true. We, 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 we treated people well and we, with respect. Um, and we put money on the table to create, create these social relationships. Our stakeholders enjoyed being involved with our students. So we sent interns to many of the agencies with whom we wanted to build relationships. and. W Water managers who talk to each other all day long were absolutely positively thrilled to spend time with our student interns and then as be part of our, pro, our, our internship pro, program. So I think we did a, a, a number of things like, uh, like that, that that built relationships in, in, in the community. And if you were to look at, at the water planning documents today, you would see way more scenario development than you would have 10, 10 years ago. So I, so I think we have some, um, some evidence to put on the table and then some personal experiences that, that, um, that we could build on. But that is, that is a huge issue. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Stefan. We have, we, are, we have a hard deadline uh, because there's the next session coming at uh, four but go ahead please and just just very quickly because the first um, Vietnam is one of the most crowded places because uh, the capacity in the country is great so it's, it's very pleasant to, to work in in the country so there are like many people working there but there is very a very big difference between developed and developing countries in developed countries 
you might want to attract decision makers so that you can have this work. In developing countries, one problem is in many cases you have just a few people doing the work. Yeah. And every time you take one day of that time, they're not doing something useful. So we had this case in a, a great piece of work in Ho Chi Minh City, and the people involved from Ho Chi Minh City spent the next year traveling the world, showing how great their job they were doing, and during that time they were not there. So there is also a self thinking that we need about are we using that time well, and we're supposed to help them not taking their time, which they should devote to the population. So this is on us, I think it's a, a ethical question that we should not use the people's time too much. Thank you, Stephen. Very last question from the young lady. Very quick one, thank you. I'm currently working on climate science, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for, adv for advice here, because there's some, something I just heard from the policy that is that in the US, it takes seven years from an, an idea to get passed into a law. So I'm just wondering, in terms of infrastructure planning and in disaster, disaster risk measures, what are some advices of factoring the current state of science into the decisions of, say, regional planning and uh, things of the, like that? Thank you. I think to some extent, uh, Professor, no, uh, he addressed the yeah. question uh, if you were here earlier. So maybe you can yeah. say a few words, and then we can yeah. wrap it up. We, we try to find some consensus in the way, let's say, scientifically proven some fact. Then um, we use that and try to translate into something that the practicing engineer can be used, can be considered. So sometimes the information we get like from scientific uh, research um, is not 100% can be translated into what we need in practice. So that is the, um, and the difficulty, but the research continue, and the communication between like two community improve. Then hopefully, like the document that I show from the Canadian Standard Association, they try to get something that- Our cities are growing busier and bigger legal. every minute, every day. It and by- people to Sorry. use that. So you see that is the <laughs> challenge in this case. I try to, I apologize. So I think people for the other yes. session are sort of, uh, Coming in, uh, I want to thank the uh, invited speakers of the session and uh, the uh, audience. Uh, hopefully, uh, you will participate as we projected. There is a number of other sessions on urban issues, as Daniel has uh, posted them. And we thank you for you, uh, your attention. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this program is for the first time at EGU. There will be a sub-program devoted to urban geosciences, and it's uh, co-sponsored by AGU. So don't forget it for uh, the next EGU conference. Thank you very much.